How'd that get up there? That was a little early. He could have waited for the song to finish, but afraid to mess up that order, wasn't he? <laughs> but thank God we do have another grandbaby. And that's no big deal. My mom's here. She's got like a hundred of those. So it's a big deal for us. We're at two. So praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, you, can, you can go to our sermon slide now. But thank you for your prayers. Many of you know that we were at the hospital a long night, Wednesday night into Thursday morning, but uh, everything worked out all right. Amen. It usually does. Praise the Lord. Uh, it's good to see you. Raymond, Tyrone here today, amen, so praise the Lord. Good to see all of you here, by the way. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> I'm here. I mean. Amen. Well, listen, we've been talking about parenting the last uh, several Sundays. As a matter of fact, the whole month of October, and we're going to deal with this uh, one more time today as we talk about no regrets, raising spiritual champions. And, of course, we've talked about the key to that is having the right standard by which to raise our kids and having a biblical standard and being willing to have the discipline it takes as an individual, as a person of God, to raise your kids according to standards. It's, we're living in a culture that's just, you know, we, we, we don't train our kids. We kind of just let them go out there and graze. And uh, that's not training or is much, not much less more than raising than your kids. But God's called us to train our children the way we should go. As we've gone through this series... Uh, I know a lot of you have been patiently sitting there and watching and listening because your kids aren't home anymore. In fact, some of them are not even not at home. They're not at home with the Lord either. I mean, they're not really serving the Lord. They're not going on with God. And that's not the way you raised them. It wasn't your expectations for them. And certainly not uh, the commitment that you made in the beginning to raise your children and nurture the admonition of the Lord. And to take, some, some, for some of you, many painstaking steps to do that and then to see your kids perhaps not go at this point in their life with the Lord and not serve the Lord. Uh, with her whole life and heart. So uh, I want to preach a message today as we've gone through this series that deals with that specifically. And the Bible does give, uh, give us some things about that. In fact, you, you don't have to go far in the scriptures to, to find parents whose children went astray. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to answer that question about why do godly parents have kids that, uh, that rebel against the Lord. Uh, I don't know the answer other than we live in a sinful nature, we live in a sinful world, with a, and, and we're born with a sinful nature. But I do believe that we can know some steps that we can take of action, biblical principles we can walk in faith in if we understand what they are. I want to talk about some of those things today because as you go through the scriptures from the book of Genesis on the way through, we have people like Adam and Noah and Samuel and Eli and David and others who had children that were, uh, didn't meet those expectations that parents had so uh, loftily had in their hearts for their children uh, to be women of God and to be men of God. So I want to talk about what we can do and look at, the, look at a passage of, of scripture that doesn't necessarily tell us why, but it does give us some direction about what we can do when, when children rebel. And if you open your Bible, Luke 15, I also have it on the screen. You can follow along there as we look in Scripture today. And we, and we see what this story that many people are very familiar with uh, about the prodigal son. And let me say as we go to this passage of Scripture, we know the basis of this is for God dealing with rebellious children. But the principles are, are applicable to parents and children as well. And Luke 15, 11 says, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on to a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate on loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him to eat. But when he came to his senses, which is, you might want to underline, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger? I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father, but uh, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him, and he ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began 
to celebrate. It's a great story, and we've heard it preached, and I've preached from this passage for over different issues and topics because there's always these eternal principles that we find in different passages of Scripture. In context, I believe we have uh, a couple of things. One is the nation of Israel rebelling against their father and having to come to the end of themselves, which they will at the end of the tribulation, and return to their father. And in principle, we also have this obvious Christian principle when, the, when you as a believer don't get, you know, when you don't do what God's told you to do and you rebel, that you find when you come to the end of yourself and come to your senses that God stands ready to love and receive and forgive you. But also for parents, I believe there's a principle here as well. Here's a, a godly father. Here's a, here's a man and who obviously pictures our heavenly father, and we can look to it as a model father about what do we do when, when our kids, you know, just rebel against God, when they, when they don't want to do what God wants to, them to do, nor do they want to do what you want them to do. What do you, what do, you, what do, you do? Well, what you see here is three stages, I believe, and we'll break this parable down into these three stages of this story. First of all, we see the rebellion. Well, this kid says, I want what I want, and I want it now, I don't want what's mine, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And then you see the stage of re-evaluation, where he's coming to a place, a personal desperation in his life, where he gets to the point to realize he's sinned against God and he's sinned against his family. The third point is the point of repentance, where he, he makes a decision. It's not good enough just to become aware of failure and, or even failing God, you have to come to the point where you repent where what you're believing in your head makes its way down to his heart. Boy, this, this story of the prodigal son is certainly a, more than a lesson even on, on the, uh, the object of God's love and how we as parents can learn some principles from the kind of love that God demonstrates. From the day your child is born, especially in those first years and in its teen years, you begin to stru- discover there's a power struggle uh, in their lives about who's going to be in control. I mean, it starts early, and I mean, uh, firstborn, you know, the parent is in control when they're there at home. It's 100%. But as they grow, and I was thinking about this holding my second granddaughter the night, as they get older, then the, those, those challenges begin. Two, three, four years of old, as early as that. They begin, who's going to be in charge here, and who's going to get controlled in this situation? And we've talked about that in some of the early sermons about parents need to establish those boundaries and those guidelines but by the time they're reaching 17 and 18 you know who, who's going to be in charge well certainly in this case this young man says I want to be in charge and uh, he uh, don't know what his attitude was obviously it's one of selfishness I mean, we don't have a whole lot of insight to what he was doing at home I don't know maybe he chose to wear his pants a little lower and turn his turban sideways uh, you know get an earring I, I, I'm not sure what what all was involved there but he didn't want his mom and dad telling him what to do anymore. He, you know, he loaded up his Camelac and drove out of town. Uh, we don't know where he went, at, at, probably not Sunset Boulevard in California, but it was the big city, I'm sure, where he took his money, what was his, and he squandered it, the Bible says, uh, King James says, on riotous living. In other words, he, he chose to go the, the party life. You know, and I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do, and how much I want to do, uh, all, all that that goes with it. And here's a, here's a father that gives a good illustration of what parents should do in these kind of situations. So what do you do when your kid says, I'm out of here. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go my own way. What steps do you take? Even perhaps though they've gone out and they didn't leave the house of rebellion, and they don't, when they do leave, they don't leave with a heart of surrender towards God or honor towards their parents. I think there's, we said the three stages. Let's look at each one of them. Stage one we said was rebellion, or verses 11 through 16. The context just basically says, give me what I want. So what's the father do? The father says, I'll let him go. And it says, the younger son set off for a distant country. I'm out of here. I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, I want the portion that falls to me, and I'm going to take it. And the tendency a lot of times here is... Uh, as parents, when they, especially when they have a rebellious child, they, they try to bribe a child. Listen, you know, you may bribe them for the moment, but that's not the way you handle these kind of situations. You know, you don't give in, and you don't try to get in this manipulative sense. You, you draw boundaries, you stand by those boundaries, you stand firm on those boundaries, because those are the things that are going to protect your children and help them. But if they say, go, uh, going, I'm out of here, they're gone, what do you do? Well, then you have to come to this place where you just let them go. In fact, the tighter you hold on sometimes, the more resistance happens until finally just this kind of explosion takes place. First step, let them go. The second step is hard. Second step is let them make their own mistakes. It says, and there the younger son, he squandered his wealth in wild living. In fact, he's doing everything that was forbidden at home. 
All the things he said you can't do. I know what others are doing, but you're not going to do that. That's not the way we're raised. Now you're, you're out on your own and, you know, your values are thrown out. And, and the Bible puts it this way. He wasted his life. He wasted his life. And by the way, for some of you who are probably kind of biting at the, 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 the reins, thinking you're going to get out and do your own thing, please understand there's a price to pay when you, when you move against not only parental standards, but obviously when you move against godly standards, rebellion always comes down to this. You squander. You waste. It's useless. By the way, do you think that the father, when he gave him that money, didn't know that he was going to waste it? <laughs> he absolutely knew what was coming. He might have told him how to spend it. We don't know. We might have told him, given him some safeguards instruction, but it, you know, he wasn't going to do it. He was going to do what he wanted to do. He knew he was, going to, he was headed for trouble. He knew he was headed for a new school of education called the School of Hard Knocks, and sometimes it is a painful place to be. There's a verse in Proverbs chapter 20, I believe it's verse 30, says, Sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. Now, that's the Joe Arms translation of it. But basically, sometimes it takes desperation to get us to change our heart, to change our, our, our minds. And I tell you, sometimes parents don't want their kids to have to make those mistakes but they're going to make them. And the, this parent is willing to let those, the kid make the mistakes. The third thing is, is, you know, is let them reap the consequences of the choices. After he spent everything, the Bible says, he began to be in need. P.S. There's always a price to pay for rebellion. There's always a wasting. There's, there's always, the Bible says, God is not mocked. Uh, what a man shows that, what are you going to reap? You know, you, you can't put down wild seeds and pray for a crop failure. The wild seeds are going to come up. And you're going to have to face what you did. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, the parent, he knows this is going to happen. And it may be that he's going to, have to face some personal shame or some personal embarrassment. Maybe somebody comes by the house and says, I saw your son in the distant country, and you wouldn't believe what he's doing. Maybe he's embarrassed, or maybe it's just heartbroken. We don't know. But there's going to be times like that. Your kids may embarrass you. They may shame you. You may have to go through experiences like that because this is not an easy deal. In fact, this young man goes out and he gets to the bottom. Doesn't say how much time it took. He said after some time in this distant country, it probably didn't take him long to spend all he had. Amen. Doesn't take long these days to spend all you've got. And then he's found himself to be in need because a famine had come over the country. Isn't that the way it usually works out? About the time you're out of money is when a famine starts. About the time you're out of money, the economy drops. He's in the same situation, and now he's facing reality, and he's facing, again, as we said, the school of hard knocks, and he's going to have to pay the price. Finally, he finds a job, the lowest job you can find for a Hebrew young man, working with pigs, slopping pigs, in the pens with the pigs, and taking care of the pigs, and feeding the pigs. In fact, he's so hungry, his boss is not even feeding him. He's having to eat whatever the pigs are, whatever they leave. And so there he is at the lowest of the low of the low, and he's in the worst of the worst, suffering for the stupid choices that he made. That's the way it works, folks, in the world we live in. And young people, you need to understand that's the way it's going to work for you. Uh, uh, it's amazing. You watch all the TV shows, and it never ends like that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, I was interesting. I had sat down with my first granddaughter, who's four years old, and uh, we sat down and watched a movie together, a children's movie. And one of the characters in this movie decided she was going to do what was wrong. But in the end, everything was marvelous. You know, it's like there were some consequences, but they never came back to make the point in the movie, hey, this person in this movie did wrong repeatedly and everything worked out. There wasn't really any personal consequences of any kind. It was just, you know, a happy ever after to sprinkle fairy dust on everybody and live with the pixies, whatever it might be. But the idea is, there's prices to pay. There's, there's some, some depths that you will reach that you, you may get in, in deep trouble. And, and parents, unfortunately, we have to let them come to that place. And I know as a parent, personally, you, you can go through some things of just self-condemnation. Where did I go wrong? What could I have done? I thought I, I took them to church. I taught them the Bible. I, they memorized scripture. I, they, I had them singing songs. I, it seemed that everything was headed in the right direction. And as soon as they were out the door, their life began to fall apart. And hey, you have to realize as a parent, you are not the only influence in your child's life. Even while they're growing up. There's a lot of influences out there in your child's life that go beyond just what you are saying to them. And it's most of the time, those other influences, books and friends and music and movies, are all the kind of influences that you don't want them to have. But they're surrounded with it every day. 
especially in this technological age that we live in. They're constantly surrounded with it. That's why we have to be, as parents, even more on guard than at any other time in any other culture, because there's so many ways to influence children that, as a parent, you have to be aware of. And some of you are behind the technological curb just a tad, like a mile or two or ten. And you have to educate yourself very quickly if you're going to stay up with what's going on because these influences are out there and they're readily available at the touch of a button, literally, to be accessed in seconds. And people are just quickly and ready to share those things with your children that you don't want shared with them. Now, you may have some blame that does fall on yourself. There may have been some failures in your own heart and life. You take accountability only for those things. You can't take accountability for all the things and blame yourself for all those things that went wrong in your child's life. They are making decisions, and they're going to have to account for those decisions. Parental responsibility ends where parental control ends. And if there's no control there, there's not a lot you're you're going to be able to do. They've moved out. They're making choices, and they are responsible for their choices. Even if you were a perfect parent, they can still rebel. They'll still rebel. They're still going to have to learn. They're still going to have to understand. They're still going to have to come to places of comprehension. And many times, those just have to be learned in some lives a harder way than other lives. I think the great temptation is that when they do hit the bottom is that there's this tendency or this temptation to want to intervene. This father was wise enough to let his child make the choices that he needed to make that led him finally to the end of his rebellion to get to the place where that, uh, that he was, had a heart to hear what the truth was and a heart to listen. Stage one's a hard stage to go through. It's a hard stage to watch your children go through. And I've watched it in my own family, a child go through this particular stage where they just want what they want and they're going to do what they want, no matter what you've taught them and no matter what you've said. It happens. Rebellion. Stage two, though, of reevaluation and regret, you know, happens after stage one, you know, where, where this rebellion comes. It says, when he came to his senses, he said, I will go back to my father's house. Now, this is what has to happen. There has to be some kind of changing in the mind and in the thinking. In fact, the word repent has to do with how we think. It's a change of thinking that produces a change of course, change of direction, a change of attitude, a change in our character. That's real repentance. But if we don't get our thoughts right and realize our failures and come to the end of ourselves, we don't come to that place. His whole attitude changes. It's no longer, I won't give me. It's now, it's gone from give me to make me. He's in this place of regretting his choices. He's in this place of of desperation. I have bottomed out. He's not coming home for a loan. He's not coming back to the house to get some more money. He's not coming to the house to get some bail money, to find a lawyer. He's not coming to the house to, to get his laundry done by mama. Amen? He's lost it all. He ain't got any laundry. The only thing he's got on stinks along with him. Amen? So he's coming home with a whole lot... I'd, I don't even want to be reckoned. I'm not worthy to be a son. Just make me one of your servants. Make me. Now that's, that's the place that you pray for in your child's life, and you pray it doesn't have to get too severe before they come to the place of real repentance in their life. But God is working the heart at the same time. So what do you do while you're in this, in this particular period from stage one to, to stage two where rebellion's going on, and you're waiting for the point where they get to the point of regret? And they're sorry, and they're recognizing what they've done. That I, you know, I caught that time when they learned to put their big boy pants on. Some people think they're adults and living like children. Think they're adults and they're trying to live in a world with no disciplines and no real choices, no real sacrifices. That's childhood still. I, I, I ride with Terry Acker the other day. We were coming back from San Angelo. And we passed a, a store that says adult bookstore, adult movies. I, th- I said, that is such a misnomer. I said, that's, they should put junior high bookstore. That's the stuff little junior high boys try to find out. Until junior high boys are sharing pictures with behind the scenes. Nothing adult about that at all. I always love adult rated movies. Adult rated movies are for people who have no self control. Come on. Amen. They have no accountability, they don't want any accountability. But what do you do when your children experience that? Number one, you pray and you never stop praying. This is that prayer without ceasing. And this kind of prayer just doesn't say, oh, Lord, bless little Timmy. Why is that living like the devil? (laughs) No inflection upon you, Brother Tim, all right? (laughs) You know, keep him out of jail. I ain't got no money. 
Can you bail him out? No. This is genuine praying. This is praying for the will of God to be done. This is praying spiritual warfare. This is praying that God bind the demons that are seeking to influence their life. And as a parent, you should probably know what those are anyway. You've raised them. You know their, you know their inclinations. You know their weaknesses. You know their, where they're most likely to, to fall into temptation. So you have that wisdom. You use it in prayer. This is where you claim in prayer the promises of God. This is where you stand in battle and you stand in armor. And you're binding Satan and his satanic forces. And you're asking God to break the, the, the power of the deception that's been reinforced not only by the devil, by their peers, and by society, by the culture, by drugs, by alcohol. You're binding and praying against all those things that God give them clarity in their mind. That God open their mind, to open their eyes. Like Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1, that I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be open. I can guarantee you while that boy's in that pig pen, when he got to the bottom, his eyes of understanding were open. He said, this is not life. This is not what God intended. My father told me about a better way. And this is not it. And I don't deserve it, but I'm at least getting out of here. I don't know what it is, but I'm not staying in this place. You know, that's where prayer comes in. But at the same time, you are committing them to God. You know, this thing's out of your control, but it's not out of His. It may be completely out of your hand, but His hands are big, and His hands are strong, and he, He's responsible, and He's reliable. And I want you to know that these kids, though you may think they're yours, they're really His. The Scripture says children are a heritage of the Lord. They belong to God. All right? Now, I know some kids, when they start thinking about it, they say, well, I think I'd rather be per turned over to my parents' discipline than God's discipline. But God knows how to get your attention. And God knows how to get their attention. And God is committed to them, so you need to continue to commit them to Him. And, and this is daily, folks. You can't say, well, you know, I prayed yesterday. Forget yesterday. Yesterday's gone. It, you're not going to see it again. You're not going to touch it again. You're not going to smell it again. Today's a new day. In fact, yesterday, you may have got a report, they're getting worse. All right? This is a brand new day. And by the way, it doesn't hurt to praise the Lord when they do get worse. I never will forget my brother been praying for me, and he'd come over and he'd pester me all the time about Jesus stuff. You know? Brother Phil, leave me alone. I'd make Jesus jokes. I'd, you know, Jesus freak. You get out of here. You know? He'd say, how you doing today? I'd say, I'm doing terrible. He'd say, praise God. <laughs> say, Thanks a lot. It's really encouraging, Christian. Get out of here. But he understood this principle because he just walked through it himself about a year before of getting to the bottom before you look out. And again, that temptation is to intervene. So you, what are you do? during this time? You're praying, you're committing to God. And three, you're waiting patiently. But let me put your waiting in faith patiently would be a better way to uh, uh, put it. I'm not, I don't want to get in the middle. I don't want to intervene. I don't want to short circuit the disciplining hand of God in their lives. All right? And I'm not just talking about kids and teens and even when they're adult years. They, they, they may go a long time. But I, I believe that God's faithful. And I believe that we pray and I believe that we can commit them and I believe that we can wait patiently and believe God during this particular time. And I believe that's the pattern that Luke sets out that we see in the prodigal's father. And I, I do believe that as he waited, he's waiting in faith. I don't believe that was the first time he walked down the road and looked down the road to see if his son was coming. I believe he daily walked out to the mailbox. He daily walked out to see if anybody's coming down the road. And he might have done it several times a day. And it just so happens on this particular day, he sees him. Why even go look? Because I'm believing he's going to come down that road sooner or later. That's why I'm looking. Because I'm praying. And because I'm putting my faith and my trust and my hope in the Lord that it's going to happen. Stage two, when they come to that place of r r understanding and they come to their senses and want to get right with God, brings us to that point where now they've turned around and they're coming back. And this is stage three, verses 20 through 24, where he does come home. He wises up. He comes to his senses. And by the way, if you're not living for Jesus, you're out of your mind. Amen. You've just lost your mind. That's the first thing people told me when I got saved. You lost your mind. I said, no, I got a new one. I know where the old one is. I didn't lose it. <laughs> I have a tendency to go back and pick it up every once in a while. It's the new one in Christ that we've become. It's a new life. It's, it's a new start. It's new beginnings. It's, it's God not condemning us, but freeing us. It's, it's grace being experienced in our life and our walk. And what, what do you do as a parent at this point? Well, I think obviously the first thing you do when, with they, when they choose to wise up is you love them faithfully. The Bible says his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. 
You say, Brother Joe, you don't know how far my kid's gone or how, how big that fall's been. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter how long you've had to wait either. The door is left open for reconciliation. Unfortunately, I've talked to some parents who become so embittered with their children and their actions towards their parents because they have been unloving and they have been selfish. And the, to talk to a parent who's closed that door, I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to, I, I, that's it. I'm not going to forgive them. But what we need is a stubborn love that says, I don't care what they do. I am not going to give out. I'm not going to bail them out in advance. I will be willing to come to the place to let them reap some consequences of what we call tough love. And unfortunately, some kids only learn that way. Some people only learn through difficult circumstances that might mean a night or maybe a year or two in jail even. It may mean an unwanted pregnancy. It may mean some drug addiction. It may mean some situations that just, you know, that, that happen that are just horrible. And we don't like those things. And we don't want to see our children experience those things. But again, it's out of our control anyway. And, and, and Satan is always seeking to destroy. But we have to be ready when a child responds with, a, with repentance in their heart and regret over what they've done with an attitude like this. I'm, I love you. I love you. And I, to love them faithfully. And number two is to accept them unconditionally. It says he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. He ran out to him when he saw him coming. He didn't run from him. And there were no conditions. He didn't run up to the kids and say, oh, man, you smell bad. You smell like a pig pen. Could have. He said, cut your hair. You get in there and get that stuff off of you. And I think he probably had slop dried on him, you know, from the pig pens. You know, he, like I say, he's got no laundry mat. He stinks. He's filthy. And what does his father do? He reaches out and he embraces him. He hugs him. He holds him. By the way, I believe the language of love is quite physical. There's an expression of touch and caring and holding and hugging and kissing this boy who's walked away from God. You say, well, Brother Joe, you know, you don't know what they've done. How can I, you know, I don't want to lower my standards. You need to understand that there's a difference between acceptance and approval. I can accept someone without approving them. I can love somebody without approving them. I mean, I've got some family members that, you know, can be just unlovable. I've got a bunch of them here today. This is not you guys, all right? <laughs> Like these guys sometimes can be too lovable. <laughs> but there's some folks, you know, that just their lifestyle is not acceptable to me. I don't approve it, but I can approve them as an individual. And I can receive them as an individual. I, can't, I don't slam the door on them. There's an acceptance. In fact, when that acceptance is expressed to them, even when they know how I feel about what they're doing, but they know I love them, when the time comes for them to repent, guess what happens? When a child has had acceptance, not approval, but acceptance, you know, uh, guess what happens when confession time comes? I believe it comes much easier. Listen to the son's confession in verse 21. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? I have sinned against God, and I've sinned against you. And by the way, this is one of the ways you can know genuine changes coming to someone's heart when they realize that God is part of the equation, and he is the first part of the equation. He starts off twice in this, prayer, in, in this story, he says, I've sinned against God. I've not just sinned against you. I've not just sinned against my parents. I know, I know what Dad said and Mom said, and I didn't do it, so I, yeah, I've sinned against them, but I've sinned against God. I didn't honor God. I have not respected God. God hadn't been part of my life. I have dishonored him. And that's where I need to start with. And that's where he does start with. Now, there may need to be at some point, I, I, I know some parents who really did mess up raising their children. In a later part in their life, perhaps, and the kids are in their late teens or so, uh, the parent gets saved. And they've had a whole generation of time go by where they perhaps haven't been imposing what we call the biblical standard, not the worldly standard, for child training. And they've made a lot of stupid mistakes, and maybe, they need, maybe there needs to be some mutual confession at this point. I don't know. I failed. I, I dropped the ball there. It doesn't hurt to be honest. And as you receive them, you forgive them, not just to accept and hear, but you forgive them completely. What's he say? He says, bring the best robe, put the ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. The son of mine was dead. He's alive again. He was lost, and he is found. Receive him. You know, here's the good thing about it, and I wrote this down. I don't know who wrote, said it, but I loved it when I read it. You know, it says, God doesn't, God doesn't rub it in. He rubs it out. Amen. Amen. And Because there's a lot of folks who just rub it in. What do you mean? They see the son, the daughter, whoever it might be, and it goes like this. 
I told you so. I knew when you left here that you were going to do that, and I knew what was going to happen when you left here, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself, and you ought to this. Hey, the sermons are over at this point. This is the invitation. All right? The lectures are done. This is the invitation for acceptance and receiving and, 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 and coming to the place of, of reconciliation. And you love this where the father comes out and basically here's the, here's the kind of chance when he gives him. Here's what it is. He says, bring a robe. Now, without going into all this, and we've talked about some of these other things, but it's the symbol of identity, obviously. It's a recognition. Up in, 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 in our case with Jesus, it's the robe of righteousness. We put on Christ. We put on his life. In this family situation, it's his father and his son coming back to say, hey, you're in a proper standing with me again. Our relationship is reconciled. Bring that ring. That was the symbol of responsibility. It was the ring. It was like a signet ring where the wax seals were made and letters were signed with these rings. It's a sign of authority. It's a sign of responsibility. It's like telling the son, here, here's the ATM card for the family. The interesting part is I looked at this a little closer. I realized that, you know, uh, this, this is really a picture of, of restoration to a full family relationship, this robe and this ring and these sandals. Because what the Father does by giving him these things is, you know, and, 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 and responding in his ways with this robe and this ring, he's saying, you know, I'm giving you back responsibility. In fact, it was a sign, all these things were a full responsibility. You're not dependent upon me now. We're dependent upon each other. There's this interdependence, you know. Now, the, the, the typical reaction of the child, of most children, is, that, well, you know, I, 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 I messed this up. And a lot of young people, and I saw this in the 60s and 70s, with so many wild children, and wild kids run away from home, you know, where they ran off to Sunset Boulevard or whatever it might be, and they get to the end of themselves and they realize, I, I made so many, I have messed this up so bad and made so many mistakes, I can't handle my own life. I can't, I can't deal with that kind of responsibility. And I, I really believe that's why the cults began to explode in those days. Because they wanted to go somewhere where somebody in authority would tell them what to do, when to do, and how to do, because they didn't feel they could be trusted with their own life anymore. And the kids became prime targets for cults. Someone to run their lives for them. They had to make mature decisions anymore. And they just sell their soul out to the, the cults. I mean, those cults had no boundaries of responsibility. But what does the father say? You're not going to be a servant. You're not going to be a servant. You're going to grow up. You're going to show some self-control. You're going to show some discipline. You're going to show some responsibilities. And I, if we miss that mark, I think we miss an important step and an important process. We take those kids now from no longer where they're kind of under our care. They are experiencing what it means to be responsible themselves and learn what it means to be responsible adults. As I said, we put our big boy pants on. And if you want to tile this, people call it the story of the prodigal son. Maybe we should call it the story of the, of the loving father, not the prodigal son. Because you want to know who the hero here. The hero is ultimately our heavenly father. And this represents, obviously, as, as I said in the beginning, how God deals with our rebellion. Because we've all rebelled against God. We've all started out in our life saying, I want what I want. I want when I want it. I want it how I want it. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. And unfortunately, there's still some people walking down that same path. And what you need to do is look at this story and realize that you're out of your mind. If you're still trying to live your life for yourself, you may think you're educated, you may think you're important, you may think that uh, you may have a great estimation of yourself, but you haven't discovered what real life is, and you haven't discovered who God is, you haven't discovered what life really is all about. Now, the problem with living out of the will of God is that we become that prodigal, and we're running from God. And when you choose to live that life, hey, you may not be in the pig pen. But I want you to know the fears, the worries, the stress, the boredom with life, the problems it creates in your, your own lives as an adult in your marriage or relationships as parenting yourself. Hey, all this stuff just called sin, it not only pours out and wrecks your life, it ruins the world. Our international problems are over this issue. The answer to the international issues it faces is we have a bunch of people that are selfish and sinful and living for themselves. What we have to do is come back to the place we subject ourselves to God. And when we do that, boy, you see the story of the loving father here? God does something supernatural in receiving and in forgiving. A word to the wise as we close here. I'll talk to young people just for a moment while I close this. You know, it's, it's so easy to live with just yourself in mind. You have the thought, you know, it's my life. It's my life. But understand, it's not just your life. 
that I put on the, on, on the overhead for the rest of your life. Mark that down. Everything you do will affect other people, and especially those in your family. Now, if you're a young person in this room, I want you to look at that again and read it to yourself and put your name in. For the rest of my life, everything I do will affect other people, and especially those in my family. I don't remember said this says, no man is an island to himself, and none of us are. We're all responsible to everybody else around us. You say, well, you know, it's my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. For you to have that mindset, my life, my body, why I do what I want to do, let me give you an illustration of how that works and how ridiculous it is when you really think about it. Let's say you're on a cruise ship. Your family's taking a cruise somewhere. And the ship begins to sink, and they put out these little dinghies for everybody to get into and get rescued in. And so everybody's in their little life-saving boats, and they're out there in their little dinghies waiting to be rescued. And you're sitting there in your little ship with your little family, and you're all sitting around waiting out there on the big Atlantic or Pacific or whatever it might be. And you just decide you're going to take out a pen knife or a little knife. And in your boredom, you just kind of start drilling little holes under your seat. It won't take long to one of your parents to say, what in the world are you doing? You're going to sink this thing if you keep that up. And then like any good teenager, you'll say something like this. Listen, this is my knife. It's my hole. I'm doing it under my seat. It's not going to affect anybody else. Well, you know if you continue to do that, you're going to sink it. And not only are you going to get wet and die, drown and die, so is everyone else in the boat. You do not have a right just to do whatever you want to do in life. You're part of a larger group. You say, well, it doesn't hurt anybody. It hurts everybody around you. You think you're sneaking off and doing something that nobody's going to know about? Listen, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. In other words, you can't come out... And, and just say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Hey, and it's Friday night, and my parents don't know where I am, and I've told them this story, and I'm doing this over here, and I, you know, I'm just going out and sow my wild oats, so to say. You can't go out and sow your wild oats and come in on Sunday and pray for crop failures. It doesn't work that way. You reap what you sow. Write it down. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man sows, that will he also reap. If you choose to live the way you want to live, and it's disregarding God and God's will and God's word, then you have to pay a price for that sin. It's going to affect you. But unfortunately, it does affect your parents. And it does affect your grandparents. And it affects your friends. It affects your whole family. It ultimately affects a nation and a world. Because God has intended in our creation for us to be not interdependent upon our own selves. That's why God, when he created man, he says he created him male and female. In other words, one of the lessons from that context of him creating male and female is that we are relational beings. We're relational beings. That we need other people. Other people need us. We need each other. More ultimately, we need God. And what we do with our life, you know, you can break your, the hearts of those people around you and you can do it so easily and with such callousness that you don't even think anything about it. Or one day you can come to your senses and see how responsible you are to the people who brought you into this world and who care about you and who pray for you. The rest of your life, what I do affects everyone around me, your family, your church, and I do not have, nor do you, have the right to do whatever you want to do just because you want to do it. It's the same as a man who would betray his wife and say, well, I just want this relationship with this other one because that's what I want to do. You know, that's ridiculous. But it's the same thing. As, as, as a man and a wife have responsibilities to one another, we have responsibilities to one another. Now we say this as I close. Some used to have kids out there that are not serving the Lord. This message was hopefully encourage you and keep you on course and keep you on track of believing God. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't stop praying. Don't stop committing. Don't stop believing. You know, just keep trusting God. The ball game's not over yet. The flag to finish the race has not been waved. The fat lady hadn't sung, so to say. She's not even warming up just yet. Jesus has not set his foot back and called us into glory. You've got this moment, and you've got this day, and you've got this time.
to believe God and to trust God and to hold on to God. God is faithful. Don't measure things by what you hear from around you. You measure things from what you hear from God. You measure things from what the Bible says. And if things do look like they're getting worse, it's just time to have a shouting party. Things are getting better. Because most of the time, we have to get to the end of ourselves. We have to get to the very bottom before we ever look up. And if you're here and you're that prodigal kid, it's time to come home. It's time to get right with God. It's time to get right with your parents. It's time to get right with your family. It's time to get right with your church. And hopefully, everyone will respond with the same celebration. Let's, let's kill the fatted calf. Now, you vegetarians, you have to bring something. <laughs> let's kill the fatted calf and let's have a party. And isn't that what the Bible says happens in heaven when one sinner <laughs> repents? Party time, but it's a righteous party, amen, based upon the glory of God. If you're here today and you're thinking, you know, I've got some kids like that, Pastor, and that's the word I needed to hear, I'm going to encourage you to do some. In a moment, we're going to give an invitation. In fact, our ensemble can come at this time. But when we give this invitation today, if you, if you have a child like that, maybe you just want to come find a place in the altar uh, and pray, all right, and just put them before the Lord again and ask God to guide you in your prayers for them and, uh, to, and, and, and knowing how to pray for them, just begin to lay them on the altar and keep them there before the Lord and ask God to do something. Perhaps you're a prodigal today and you need to get right with God. You may have been in that situation where you haven't left home physically, but mentally and emotionally you have. It's time to come home. Why go to the pig's pen and the end of that mess? Why bottom out? Why don't you just get it right today? It may, need to, it may be you need to go to, your, to mom and dad and say, hey, I've sinned against the Lord and against you and I want to ask you to forgive me. I've asked God to forgive me. And see what God does. It can be a glorious, glorious time of fellowship and communication and celebration and reunion. But you have to be honest. You have to be honest. And that's where it all starts, being transparent and letting God do His work in us. Would you stand? If you're here without Christ today, when we give this invitation, we begin to worship the Lord.